Uh, welcome back to the second segment uh, of today's annual memorial lecture event in honor of Tandikam Kandawiri. Uh, Dr. Kaja Hujo will chair today's roundtable panel discussion. Kaja is the senior research coordinator in the transformative social policy program of UNRISD and a member of the Institute's senior management group. Kaja's academic work focuses on social policy, poverty, inequality, socioeconomic development and sustainability transition. Much of her research is at the interface of economics and politics, covering, for example, the political economy of pension reform, social protection and poverty reduction, social policy in mineral rich context, the politics of domestic resource mobilization for social development, and more recently on the political drivers of inequality. Before joining UNRISD in 2006, Kaja was a research fellow and lecturer in Latin American Institute at Free University Berlin. She studied economics and political science at Ebert Hall University, Tibogen, uh, Free State, Free, Free University Berlin, and the National University of Cordova, Argentina, and holds a doctoral uh, degree in economics from uh, Free University. Uh, in 2004, she was visiting fellow at CIE PP Buenos Aires. Uh, over to you, Kaja. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for the kind uh, introduction and welcome everybody to the second part of this very important event uh, celebrating the life and work of Tandika Makanda Weary. It's, it's a great pleasure um, also for myself uh, to be part of this event and my thanks to, to the uh, Sachi Chair of Social Policy at the University uh, of South Africa and Kodesria, Godwin Morunga, and all those who support uh, and have endorsed this event in the first part um, this morning. Um, we had a very inspiring memorial lecture by Professor Fiona Tregena in the lively discussion. And I have now the pleasure to introduce you to five outstanding scholars whose research is inspired by and contributes to the legacy of Tendika's work and the questions he had raised. The panel has a particular focus on the prospects for a developmental state in Africa, which is the key topic of today's event. And of course, a particular focus of Tendika's work. After having heard about the prospects for catching up and industrialization, from Professor Tregena. During this panel, we will hear more about agriculture as well as green energy, um, in, in addition to discussions about the prospects for a developmental state. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the presentations uh, that are coming. Um, just to say that the occasion of celebrating Tandika's work and legacy and how, how we actually nurture, as Jimmy said, this growing network of scholars who are inspired by his ideas and who follow in his footsteps in terms of creating these integrated, interdisciplinary and historically in context grounded analysis of development problems and of development challenges across the world, but in particular for Africa um, is really something um, that is very important in my own work. And I join Fiona in saying that these events are a great occasion to revisit his writings and to really delve into his articles and chapters and books. And it is a very inspiring journey. Uh, every time I do that, I learn a lot and um, I'm glad that he was a director and mentor um, of the work we are doing uh, at UNRIST. So in order to not cut further into time, by reading out the detailed bias of our eminent speakers, I would like to refer you to their um, 
uh, to the information that you can find in the program. I would also like to encourage you when you listen to the presentations that you already note down your questions or directly put them into the uh, Q&A box you find at the bottom of the screen. We will have time for discussion after the presentations. So I have now the honor to invite our first speaker, Dr. Grieve Chava from the New School in New York, talking about the impossibility argument and the developmental state in 21st century Africa. Dr. Chava, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kaja Hujo. It's, uh, it's an honor to meet you, and I look forward to meeting you one day in person. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, fraternal greetings from, <clears throat> from New York City, where it is 8.14 in the morning. Uh, I'm ordinarily in Lusaka, Zambia, but I uh, work for the new school in New York City, and I often travel uh, back and forth. Uh, so this particular day has caught me in New York City. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the South African Research Chair Initiative in Social Policy, uh, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, and the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development for this kind invitation to participate in today's remembrance of one of Africa's and indeed the world's greatest economists and social scientist, Professor Tandika Mkandawire. I'm incredibly humbled by this invitation. Uh, this event will certainly live in my memory for many, many years to come. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Mkandawire's family for first and foremost sharing him with us and allowing us to remember Prof, as I will call him in this way, as we are doing today. Thank you so much to the family. Um, a special thank you to uh, Professor Jimmy Adeshina, uh, who is a Saatchi Chair in Social Policy for the hard work and very clear, detailed, but relaxing way he has communicated with us, the panelists, uh, in the run up to today's event. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Fiona Tregena for delivering a masterful lecture, uh, certainly befitting the, mem the memory of our Mwalimu Tandika Mkandawire. Um, the inspiration for my panel presentation uh, today is Professor Mkandawire's timeless 2001 article, Thinking About development, Developmental States in Africa, which appeared in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. It has already been mentioned uh, uh, already in this, in this particular event. Um, this is his most cited publication with 1,257 citations as of this morning. Um, this number certainly does not include the many people who have informally cited this paper in their efforts to make sense of the African situation and how to bring about positive change. Uh, for example, I was once at a workshop on debt held by civil society organizations in Nairobi in 2019 and was amazed by the extent to which thinking about developmental states was referenced in that day's deliberations. And as you can imagine, this is really impact because this is our colleagues in civil society who one may say deal with practical things, but in that day's deliberations, thinking about developmental states was really used as a framing uh, resource material to guide that day's discussions. As anyone who has closely studied Professor Mkandawire's work, uh, anyone who has uh, closely studied Professor Mkandawire's work can attest that it is almost an exercise in futility to pick a favorite of his work because all of it is just good, all of it is just brilliant. But thinking about developmental states is really up there for me and is prof at his finest, not least because of the play with words that he demonstrated in that article. Few economists, if at all any, can claim to write the way prof wrote in that article uh, and certainly many others of his work. <clears throat> Here's an example of just magnificent writing uh, taken from the intro of that, of that paper. You, you'll forgive me as I, it's, it's quite, of an, quite an extensive quote. One remarkable feature of the discourse on the state and development in Africa is the disjuncture between an analytical tradition that insists on the impossibility of developmental states in Africa 
and a prescriptive literature that presupposes the possibility of their presence. That's just beautiful. States whose capacity to pursue any project is denied at one level are exhorted at a prescriptive level to assume roles that are beyond their capacity, character, or political will. Such states are urged to delink, to reduce themselves, to stabilize the economy, to privatize the economy, to engage in good governance, to democratize themselves and society, to create an enabling environment for the private sector, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, to do that which they cannot do. That's the opening uh, uh, sentence, some sentences from the intro of that remarkable article, just really demonstrating the dexterity with which Prof used language, um, but to devastating effect. In thinking about developmental states, Prof Mukandawire made so many contributions, one of which was to provide a realistic definition of a developmental state. And here his definition was as follows. A developmental state is one whose ideological underpinnings are developmental and one that seriously attempts to, de to deploy its administrative and political resources to the task of economic development. A developmental state is one whose ideological underpinnings are developmental and one that seriously attempts to deploy its administrative and political resources to, to the task of economic development. Our prof placed the word attempt in italics to stress the trial and error characteristics of the development process, or what Deng Xiaoping characterized as crossing the stream whilst feeling for, for the pebbles. In this way, failed attempts at development were not sufficient to dis disqualify one from being thought of as a developmental state. And for prof, economic development itself is a result of high rates of accumulation and structural change in the direction of industrialization as Professor Fiona so eloquently, eloquently demonstrated earlier today. A second contribution of the paper was to confront the so-called impossibility argument for developmental states in Africa, an argument that was so forcefully made by the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the IMF and the World Bank, but also made by many other analysts, some of whom could be considered progressive and even allies of the continent. The impossibility argument acknowledges the primacy of developmental states for economic development, as certainly happened in the Asian case, but argues that such states are impossible in the African case for a host of reasons. The genius of Professor Mkandawira in this article was to one, assemble a typology of the arguments that constituted the impossibility argument, and two, to show that these arguments were false and thus making the case for not only the necessity, but the possibility of developmental states in Africa. What I'd like to do is to revisit that typology that Prof assembled in thinking about developmental states to see how the impossibility argument fares in this, the third decade of the 21st century. In other words, was the impossibility argument permanently slain in 2001 or have events since then begun to turn in its favor? Uh, that is the question I'd like to explore. Uh, in this talk. By way of the refresher, the following typology of impossibility arguments was assembled in that blockbuster article from 2001. The first one was a lack of ideology. The second one was lack of technical, analytical, and administrative capacity. The third one was neo-patrimonialism. The fourth one was a public choice and rent-seeking arguments. And the, 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 the last one, the fifth one, was an absence of good economic performance. Basically, these sets of arguments were marshaled by those who, who argued for the impossibility of a developmental state uh, in Africa. Right. I'd like to pay attention to the first, lack of ideology. Second, lack of technical, analytical, and administrative capacity. And the, la and the fifth one, the last one, absence of good economic performance um, uh, to sort of uh, try to see essentially how the impossibility argument fares today. And I'm focusing on these three precisely because the neo-patrimonialism uh, argument and the public choice rent-seeking arguments have, in my humble opinion, been, been so devastatingly debunked that no serious scholar of African development can ever raise them again. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Prof, in a, in a relatively recent article, I think uh, dealt a fatal blow to neo-patrimonialism uh, 
the public choice rent seeking arguments and the, the article for those who are interested came out in 2015 in world politics and it's called neo patrimonialism and the political economy of economic performance in africa critical reflections okay so the question is how is impossibility argument faring in the third decade of the 21st century in answering this question i'll work my way backwards by starting with the uh, with the argument on the absence of good economic performance and work my way uh, 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 towards capacity as well as lack of ideology. Uh, the basic argument here is that the development of states are not possible in Africa because the continent has always been a growth tragedy. Who here can forget uh, William Easterly's and uh, Ross Levin's 1997 article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which was simply titled Africa's Growth Tragedy. Prof showed that up to 2001, Africa's growth record, both in space and time, was so varied, making the growth tragedy thesis, thesis untrue. What about the 21st century? What can be said about Africa's growth record? <clears throat> Again, much like Prof ascertained in his paper, the African growth record in the 21st century is varied across space and time. That is to say, some countries have respectively grown at certain periods of time, while others have not, and some countries have grown at certain uh, uh, at certain points in time and not grown and not grown at others. So really, the growth record, much like Prof Prof had, uh, had concluded up to two thousand and one, is also varied uh, in the twenty first century. A classic example is my own country, Zambia, which grew on average by some seven percent per annum in the decade two thousand to two thousand and nine, and then subsequently grew much slower at about 2% per annum in the decade 2010 to 2019. This pattern was very much replicated across much of the African continent and is encapsulated in, for example, the Economist newspaper's coverage of the growth record on the continent uh, in the 21st century, where they moved from a cover story in 2001 that encapsulated or that announced Africa rising to more pessimistic stories in the second decade of the 21st century. As with the period studied by Prof, Economic performance in Africa is varied across space and time and is largely driven by the external environment, especially dynamics in the commodities markets and especially most poignantly demonstrated by the COVID pandemic and the unfortunate war that's currently, currently raging in Ukraine. What about uh, the other uh, uh, set, set of argument um, in favor of the impossibility argument? So the other argument against, uh, the other sets of arguments against the development of state which is sort of a lack of technical, technical, analytical, and administrative capacity. The argument here is that the developmental states are impossible in Africa because African states lack the technical, analytical, and administrative capacity to carry out its role. One of the most condescending statements of this argument was contained in Lewis and Stein's 1997 article in World Development, uh, uh, who, who wrote, the extensive coordinated economic interventions of the developmental East Asian states are well beyond the administrative faculties of most African governments. I'll read that again because it is such a shocking statement that it appeared in scholarship, in published scholarship. The extensive coordinated economic interventions of the developmental East Asian states are well beyond the administrative faculties of most African governments. Is there anything to be said about the technical, analytical, and administrative capacity in Africa in the 21st century? The answer is certainly yes. The continent has faced and continues to face many crises in the 21st century, and one is struck by the dexterity with which many of these crises have been confronted and in some non-trivial instances overcome and working with very limited and stretched resources. I'd like to mention here a few examples, leaning heavily again on the Zambian case, which I believe is not a, an atypical case. For example, infrastructure. At the time of Prof's writing in 2001, the continent was in the throes of an infrastructural backlog whose origins lay in the crisis of the 1980s and the prescriptions that came out of it. We all know that the infrastructure backlog that was ravaging at the time Prof was writing was very much again instigated by the Bretton Woods institutions as, uh, as they made the argument that, you know, uh, government should, the state should roll back even from providing infrastructure. But since Prof's writing, many parts of the continent have begun to impressively close the infrastructure backlog by initiating and completing many complex infrastructure construction projects. A classic example, example here is a 750 megawatts Kafir Gorge power station in Zambia, Kafir Gorge lower power station, 
in Zambia, whose construction was was planned many years, many decades ago, but was initiated in 2015 in response to a crippling power deficit that was then afflicting the country. <coughs> the project was completed on, on schedule and has made the country largely energy sufficient and in some instances, a net exporter of power. Examples also abound from other parts of the continent. Obviously, this has been helped along by the role of China that has provided a relatively affordable project finance, but still one cannot discount the role of uh, the African bureaucracy, the African state in seeing through um, uh, some of these projects. In many cases, some of these projects also require counterparty funding on the part of the African state, as is illustrated with the Kafir Gorge Lower project. Um, I'd also like to quickly talk about the farmer input support program in Zambia, which turned Zambia into a maize deficit country in much of the 1990s to a maize surplus country in the 21st century. I beg your pardon, my, um, I have a cold. I'd like to talk about the farmer input support program, which turned Zambia into a maize deficit country, uh, which turns Zambia into a maize, um, farmers, which turns Zambia into a maize, uh, into a, it turns Zambia from a deficit country in much of the 1990s to a maize surplus country in the 21st century, a program that required a vast mobilization of human and financial resources to carry out. <laughs> also like to talk about the handling of the COVID pandemic and the delicate balancing of lockdowns versus allowing for economic activity to go on. Many African governments deploy track, trace, and isolation methods well before countries in the West knew what was going on. Many African states did this so well to the bafflement of colleagues in the West that there's now a veritable industry of research papers to find the dead that the Africans, the, the dead that Africans are hiding from COVID, right? So the African state has a technical, analytical, and administrative capacity required for a developmental state, even in the 21st century. But what we continue to see are recommendations again from the Bretton Woods institutions uh, to undermine such capacity as happened during structural adjustment and continues to happen even today, right? In the Zambian case, uh, Zambia is on back on an IMF program and one sees in that program uh, pretty much uh, a policy advice that's predicated on rolling back the African state, uh, the Zambian state. And I'd like to talk about the last uh, uh, set of argument uh, that was adduced to say uh, you could not have a developmental state in Africa. And this is a lack of a developmentalist ideology. The argument here is that a developmental state requires an ideology of development anchored in some sort of a nationalist project. And the absence of such an ideology in Africa has precluded the emergence of a developmental state. Prof Mkandawira in his article showed that post-colonial states, uh, that the post-colonial states he studied up to 2001 were identified by having a very strong developmentalist ideology as memorably articulated by some of the first generation post-independence leaders, right? I think uh, another one of Prof's very famous um, articles which Prof Fiona um, certainly referenced and uses in her title is uh, borrowing from uh, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere's African, uh, Africa must run while others walk. That was essentially an articulation of this developmentalist ideology. Sadly, this is the one aspect where it seems that the tide has swung, hopefully not too far in the direction of the impossibility argument. Today, one is hard pressed to find an African state or even African heads of state that articulate a coherent and cogent developmentalist ideology anchored in a nationalist project. To be sure, many states promulgate national development plans every so often, but these are done mostly as checkbook exercise, exercises or as preconditions for the receipt of aid in one form or the other. Not to mention the content that shies away from statist aspirations. These documents do not and have not become the documents that mobilize and focus the energies and imagination of the state to pursue transformative development. Again, this state of affairs is not without an explanation. Most states in Africa are dominated by ministries of finance and central banks, which are in turn led by <laughs> Most states in Africa are dominated by ministries of finance and central banks, which are in turn led by economists who have been trained not in development planning or long-term planning or develop or sort of thinking about the processes and structures of development, but in anti-status macroeconomic stability, which came into vogue 
at the behest of the Bretton Woods institutions in the 1980s. Uh, many ministers of finance today and central bank governors have had ex extended stints in the Bretton Woods institutions, and you can name them uh, the current um, uh, Minister of Finance in Zimbabwe uh, has had a stint uh, in, a, in, 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 in an IFI. Uh, the current Minister of Finance in Zambia has had a stint in an IFI. The current Central Bank Governor in Zambia has had an instant, a stint in, a, in an IFI, Bretton Woods Institution type organization. The current Governor of, um, of uh, the Central Bank in Kenya has also had such a stint. So we have a situation where many of our Ministers of Finance and Central Bank Governors were are really trained in macroeconomic stability and not so much in thinking about, or at least are socialized in macroeconomic stability concerns and not so much so concerns about the processes of long-term development. Uh, and surprisingly, Prof wrote about this phenomenon. He wrote about many things, but he also wrote about this phenomenon. And surprisingly, in a 2014 article in African Studies Review called The Spread of Economic Doctrines and Policymaking in Post-Colonial Africa, where he carefully documented the ideological under, underpinnings of different generations of African economists since independence. And he was able to show and trace that many of the folks running uh, the economies in our countries really were trained in the 80s at a time in which the vogue was macroeconomic stability. So to conclude, the impossibility argument is not faring so well in the third decade of the 21st century, as, have I, as I have articulated. Um, many of the arguments in its favor still do not hold water. Uh, but worryingly, and perhaps in its favor, is that the 21st century African state is not as developmentalist in its orientation as its predecessors, right? And part of this is really a, a sort of a long-term effect of the structure adjustment process, uh, which means that there's much work to be done for those of us who are beneficiaries of Prof. Kandawiri's scholarship and begin to think deeply about how do we get our states to to adopt, or at least how do we get those who run our economies to adopt this developmentalist ideology? We need to study this. I think this is a challenge that is uh, that Prof, Prof scholarship has given to my generation to really think quite deeply about this impossibility argument, especially now in you know, this issue of ideology. Why is it that our states are not developmentalist in orientation? What has gone wrong, right? So studying really that, uh, that process. Um, Colleagues, this is uh, the remarks I wanted to share with you this morning. I apologize for the incessant coughing, but I picked up a cold here in New York City where the weather is changing for the worse. Thank you. <laughs>